good afternoon and um, uh, welcome to this session which has a title which I think most of us dispute called No Country for Women. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time giving detailed introductions of the panelists on this session uh, because I think given the kind of interaction we had in the last session, this is certainly a subject that uh, should invite much greater interaction from all of you who are here. And hence I have requested that all the lights stay on so that we are not isolated with these bright lights shining on them. Um, today is February 16th. It's exactly two months since uh, what is variously referred to as the Delhi incident. And I think in many ways uh, what happened in Delhi on December 16th has thing that we are addressing this issue. It's welcome that it's being talked about on television channels, that newspapers are opening up spaces for writing about it, that it's being talked in homes, in colleges, and in fora like this. But I think the question still remains whether after all this talk, is there going to be a difference? Given the transient nature of our attention span on a whole range of issues, um, are we going to move on to something else if something more dastardly happens? in the next few days. Given the fact that the focus has remained limited to certain aspects of this issue, are we going to forget that even as we sit here and talk about it in this beautiful setting, that a woman somewhere is being brutalized just as that young woman was on the 16th of December? Um, are we going to ever get down to really understand why this happens? Do all these words, all these discussions actually make us comprehend why we can even contemplate a title like this, No Country for Women. So uh, we are going to discuss it from many different perspectives here and we're lucky today that we have three people on this panel who will bring different perspectives. Rahul Bose, who you've already heard this morning, who I don't need to introduce. Uh, Kalpana Kanabiran also, I should not be, uh, I have to introduce because she's a well-known person, but she's also sociologist and legal researcher and currently director Council for Social Development in Hyderabad, and the detailed introduction about her is there in your brochures. And Nilanjana Roy, who is also a very well-known name and also a judge uh, for the prize that will be given tomorrow, and a writer. And as I just discovered this morning, she also writes about food, which I had no idea about. So there are many hidden talents that our panelists have. So our attempt, um, I think we have about 50 minutes our attempt now will be, I will, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to say something. Perhaps we will have a bit of a conversation if I have some questions for them. And then we will open it up and we would like to know what your questions are, which can be addressed either to each of us individually or you can address them generally and one of us will take it up. So we'll divide it up so that there is enough time for all that. Um, so first I'd like to invite uh, Kalpana Kannabiran uh, to speak, say whatever you will about this issue. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, I'd actually like to begin uh, by looking at the title of the session, No Country for Women. The more I look at it, I wonder, is this a categorical assertion? Is this a question? Is it a doubt? Or is it a lament? Whatever it might feel like, I think it's important for me to assert at this time that this country belongs to women. There cannot be a doubt, there cannot be an assertion, there can't be a lament. This country belongs to us, it belongs to women. It has been built on the productive and reproductive labor of women. Women have shaped it with their ideas and ideologies, and women have resisted and fought to keep that space. And what we have witnessed time and again is patriarchy's constant um, move to disinherit women. It is systemic. The violence is not new. We are talking about two months from Delhi, but we know this is not two months old. 
nor is the resistance that we witnessed in Delhi new. There has been resistance before. It's taken different sh forms. It's taken different shapes. This is the shape of this time. It isn't an answer to all, uh, to the entire problem of sexual assault. It's not an answer to the problem that women face in a society like ours, where sexual assault is one small piece of the violence and discrimination that women face. I also think that what we are witnessing today is a colonization of women's bodies and their incarceration in families, in communities, in, uh, through practices of violence that range from marital rape to uh, collective sexual assault as part of honor crime, to sexual assault as part of caste atrocity, to sexual assault as part of military occupation, to sexual assault as part of targeted violence against minorities. And each of these takes very specific forms, has very specific meanings, and has a very specific implication in the law and in our understanding of justice. But in that broad understanding of justice, and we could probably discuss that at length later, the question of law and justice is really embedded in women's experience of discrimination and violence in societies. But I think that in that broad understanding of justice, any form of lawful and lawful in courts murder is not a resolution to rape or sexual assault. We have been hearing about the death penalty for rape. And in my view, the death penalty is just, the death penalty for rape is firmly located within the honor paradigm. So it doesn't really remove us from the ideological apparatus that condones, sanctions, and perpetrates rape over generations. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. I think we should come back to the issue of the law because I think one of the sort of myths that have come up in the last two months with the sort of popular demonstrations is this kind of perpetuation of this belief that somehow some tweaking or some change in the law or having uh, the kind of punishment that the government has brought in with the death penalty, with the ordinance, even though the Justice Varma Committee has argued very persuasively against it and as have women's groups for many years, uh, the belief that somehow this will change things. So I think this is something we should take forward uh, when we do discuss this. But let's move on now to Rahul, who has been outspoken on many issues, uh, including issues to do with women. And I'd like to know what your take is, not only on, on the specific subject, but what you yourself as an individual feel about the future and what needs to be done. Thanks, Kalpana. Thank you. Just before I start to say what I was going to say, Kalpana, I, I, this Kalpana, I would like to just, uh, before it slips my mind, we can get back to it, talk about how it's not a coincidence that societies that are more patriarchal believe in the eye for an eye um, retributive form of justice and societies, if you look around the world, that have a greater record of, um, of gender parity uh, don't. They believe in the more reformative and the more um, uh, non-patriarchal forms of justice. But we can get back to that later. I'm constantly asked by boys, by men, what are you going for? And for the last 10 years after the Gujarat riots, when, Kalpana, you very briefly alluded to forms of violence on women, minorities and things, I was astonished by the kind of violence that was um, um, wreaked on women uh, during the time. And that was my inflection point. Others have other inflection points. But I'm constantly being asked in the last decade by boys and men, what are you going for? You're going for a, a women's rally? Why? I mean, what for? We understand you're very compassionate and all that, but so what? So I've been putting my head to this very, very hard, especially in the light of December 16th, uh, to find if it is indeed true that we cannot achieve a world that doesn't violate its women without men understanding that. How do we get that to happen? How can they just not be passers-by in this entire um, uh, movement? And I, I've come across one solution. There might be many. Part of the, the happy part of the sad story of rape every 20 minutes or a dowdy death every 30 and other kinds of violence is that it leaves in its wake 
damaged men an angry father a hurt and puzzled son a brother who might even be ashamed for no reason but he feels the sense of shame and i think too little has been done to address this constituency these um these men are if i can call them secondary victims of violence but they feel the violence all the same and they're not prepared to deal with it so if there was an outreach to these men first out of the constituency of men to these men first i'm sure we would find warriors for this for this fight amongst them apart from also helping their feelings their confusions about patriarchy and what they were taught as they were growing up to what they can be secondly this story that i keep hearing everywhere that look the police are the way they are and the judiciary is the way it is because they've grown up in a culture of patriarchy will not do some institutions have been created like this very institution we're sitting in right now have been created to follow a path of humanity regardless of what's going on around them and the time has come now and it is not a big deal for the police to sensitize themselves and to to set an example by sensitizing the entire process from when a survivor walks in to a police station to finally the case being investigated as well as for example the judiciary or for that matter politicians i'm sorry it cannot it cannot hold any more that we tend to say you know but he's a product of this entire patriarchy so he can say what he likes about women like we heard a comment of a minister yesterday it just cannot happen we have to have zero tolerance for our institutions to to we cannot condone that kind of behavior any more in our institutions to start with we have to raise our boys better you know and i don't mean putting them in great schools only if your boy comes back home and you're catching a train to go out for a holiday and he sees his mother walking two steps behind his father that's what he will believe the world is if the boy comes home and if it's a question of should i take science or commerce he talks to his father versus mom i have to go tomorrow for a trek i need these shoes it will not do it cannot do all of us are guilty of it so we have to understand that they will only do as they see not as they are told we have to show them that in our houses of course in our schools and finally can we start a con a conversation about forgiveness can we start a conversation about reformation can we even begin to imagine talking to those six men who gang raped uh, the survivor of december 16th and see which of them wants a second chance which of them genuinely understands would that not be our greatest victory it might not f fall within the purview of no country for for women but i think it's something to ponder about to think about civilizationally where we want to be in years to come thanks thank you rahul i think that last point um, it should be discussed a little more uh, but i think what you're right that you know we have to contemplate what kind of civilization we want to be and i think it links up very much with uh, kalpana's point that you know the patriarchy which is a very long word but which has a very simple meaning it has worked to disinherit when actually around us not much is being done okay i had a very grim list uh, to share with the audience here a list of egregious of rapes specifically and each one of these rapes happened in the week before december 16th at various locations around the country each one of them i think tells us something about how deeply violence is embedded in society uh, one rape was of a 70 year old grandmother by her nephew her nephew had decided to rape her after watching his father rape her several times uh, that case hasn't been filed in haryana it was filed as an fir at the police station 
and it's probably going to be dismissed for lack of evidence. Um, three days after that, and three days before December 16th, we, there was a one paragraph mention in the papers of the rape of a five-year-old girl by a temple priest, who's probably going to get off because he has political connections. Shortly before that, two weeks before that, we heard about a series of rapes and orphanages. It was significant that the media focused on the young girls, the teenagers who were hurt in this assault, but again, the stories of the young boys, some of them as young as seven and eight, who had also gone through violent abuse had been erased. Um, I was also doing something that um, one doesn't really want to do, uh, telling the list of cases not filed in Chhattisgarh and Kashmir around that time, uh, rapes that will never be on the official record of men um, and uh, assaults on men, rapes on women by security forces and by police forces. In that week, I think the tally had crossed about 22 and then December 16th happened, so I stopped counting for a little while. And horrific as this sounds, these protests were not the first, but I just want to get into the story of where we are through some of the slogans that came up over the last two weeks and then compare that with what the media is saying, what we are not talking about, what we are talking about a little more. Uh, just at one billion rising, two days back, Maya Rao, performance artist, starts off by saying, I want to walk. I want to walk at 10 p.m. I want to walk at 3 a.m. if I feel like a walk. Which one of you wants to walk with me? I want to walk in complete freedom. I want to walk without fear. I want to walk without a man next to me who is also fearing for me. And you should have heard the applause from that audience because um, this is one part of what, again, the media does talk about, but frequently negatively. I made a list of places where women are actually raped in Delhi and UP, as opposed to places where people think they're raped. The assumption is that women are raped in nightclubs or women are raped in marketplaces if they're out there at 10 a.m. They're raped in buses or in transport that they happen to take because they're working at call centers. The truth is that uh, a lot of the rapes in Delhi happen in bathrooms, uh, in slums where you have bad connections between the main block and between the cluster of bathrooms at the back and you don't have enough street lighting. Street lighting also leads to the category of the other rapes. You're coming back home usually in the twilight zone between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. and uh, the distance between your bus stop and your house is unsafe. Your home is unsafe both for domestic help who work out there and for the women at home as well, the men at home, 90% of uh, rapes recorded say that the women know their assailant. It's either a neighbor or a family member. You know? These are not new statistics again, but I think it puts one thing on the agenda, which is space and territory. And one of the ways forward is to move away from just the story of safety and protection and say, how much space are you going to allow women and men to claim? The second, I mean, this also goes into political areas. For example, the territory that a Dalit woman might claim or that a Kashmiri man might claim is significantly less than the territory that the rest of us have to play with. The second slogan on the table came from Kavita Krishnan, who was ranting about the Delhi police and the way they handle cases. And she said, you know, this entire rhetoric about freedom, it's often couched in terms of safety and protection. And as women, we don't want to be protected anymore. We don't even want men to carry the burden of that protection. We don't want to sit at our homes trying to gauge when we are going to be safe or not. We really want to step out when we like. The backlash to that comes up very fast. The other thing that came up in the context of December 16th was the number of voices who immediately pecked away at women's freedoms all across. No, you know, not just in terms of rape and safety, but in terms of women should actually be at home. They should not demand to work. They should not have to go out here. They should not have to do this. And I found myself thinking of a recent judgment by one of the Kaap Panchads. The Kaaps are these village councils that are very strong in Haryana. And frequently they're seen as anti-women. But one of the judgments that they'd passed prevented both men and women from talking on mobile phones. So I went down there and sat down with some of them and I said, okay, I understand why you don't want women to talk on mobile phones. 
because there's a direct connection then between them and their home families and it's therefore more difficult for their husband's families to exercise some control over them. But what is this with the men? And they said, you have no idea what's going on out here. The young men aren't listening to us. They want to marry whom they choose. They think the women should walk anywhere. They think the women should wear what they want to. They want to wear what they want to. We're having so much trouble. Even the Mayhem Kaap couldn't pass this ruling because those young men have got into the Kaap Panchayats. And I find that fascinating. You know, if we have, I've heard versions of this story coming up from young Muslim men who are beginning to militate against the All India Muslim Personal Law Board and say, your rules about women are not fair, we don't agree with this. It seems that these are the things that again don't get attention. Um, the last slogan I just wanted to leave with you was the chant of Azadi. And um, I'm going to say it in Hindi first because it was so beautiful, but this was echoing all around Delhi. It's an old slogan, it came out of Kashmir, it came out of independence, it has long roots. And there were women and men on the streets singing, Hamko chahiye azadi, office mein chahiye azadi, ghar mein chahiye azadi, raaste mein chahiye azadi, bistar mein chahiye azadi. And translated what that means is, uh, we want freedom. We want freedom in the office. We want freedom on the streets. We want freedom in our homes. We want freedom in our beds. And that brings me to the last category of things on the table, which is, the discomfort with allowing people to be free when in their love lives, you know, to be free about who they choose to love, how they choose to love. Uh, that constant policing of that space, one of the first reactions that Bombay had after the deadly rape was to go after unmarried couples and say, what right do you have to be on the street together, you know, implying that basically there is no relationship more sanctioned than marriage, which ignores the other horrific statistic of domestic violence as 55% uh, and rising reported, which is close to the child abuse statistics, 59% and rising. Now, if this all sounds depressing, I don't mean it to be. I just want to ask a corollary to Rahul's question about forgiveness, which is when are we going to start actually changing our own families, you know? When are we going to start practicing a certain kind of love and meaningful equality out there? And if you want to change rape, if you want to acknowledge that this is a country for women, maybe it has to start right there. Yeah, thank you. I think we've touched on, uh, you know, different aspects of this issue, but perhaps we've left out a few. Um, but I'll just, on your uh, thing, Nilanjana, I'll just say, I think the positive thing, even in the media, crass as it sometimes is, is that because it's opened up the space, suddenly issues that would never have been a subject for discussion are becoming. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Vyadar Ravi's very sexist remark against a Matrubhumi uh, uh, young woman television reporter when she asked him about the Suryaneli case recently. It was played out on television and it was written about and he's been forced to apologize. Now, as a woman journalist, I know that there are cases like this that happen all the time of women, especially who, uh, women journalists who cover politics and who just have to swallow it and will not be able to in any case make it an issue. And the fact that now these things are enough currency to be recognized as something that ought to be in the public space and talked about, I think is a positive thing that will make people realize that it's, the, the arena is vast in terms of violence and sexual harassment and all kinds of aspects of women's lives that are unspoken on the whole in this country and certainly unaddressed to a large number. But in the question of addressing, I want to come back to this issue of the law because I think somehow on a whole range of issues in this country, there is a belief that justice has been done. I mean, we won't go into the Afzal Beg thing, but that again, the, the sort of conversation is why are we questioning it justice has been done and therefore in the case of women also the law has been changed you know an ordinance has been passed it shows how concerned the government is about women so justice will be done now is that really true and I'd last uh, my namesake to comment on it Well, what uh, seemed to set this particular, the December 16th uh, incident apart was the, the whole 
uh, revival of the debate on the need for a new law. In a sense, of course, it is impossible to make any headway in combating sexual assault without an adequate legal framework. That is a starting point, in a sense, of acting on a particular incident. Because you can raise a general issue, you can have a general frame of reference, but you still have to tackle it from case to case and follow it from the trial court up to the Supreme Court. So you do need a law, and you need that law to actually be uh, to, to, you need that law to enable you to actually push that case forward. But the law is just an instrument. By itself, I mean, you can have a very, very good uh, legislation. By itself, it does nothing. It depends on who is pushing it, and how they are pushing it, and who is receiving it at the other, at the other end. And in the who is pushing it, there are if there are an entire range of actors. So basically what this means is that we can't only talk about having a law because that isn't an answer. You need a good law, that's a starting point, but it's only a starting point. The change really has to be much more deep-rooted. The, the conversations have to be much more wide-ranging. And I think uh, the, the point that Rahul raised is extremely important, that there is no way that this law will speak for us if the reality within which that law is being made to operate remains unchanged. And this has been our experience for several decades. When we asked for a reform in rape laws, we got some measure of change, not everything that we wanted, but some measure of change. But the context remains unchanged. So you can say in the law that past sexual history should not be raised. But that doesn't prevent courts and the actors in that entire system from constantly referring. It doesn't prevent the media, for instance, from throwing up this one stray comment that will then get swallowed up by the readership because they believe they believe and locate sexual assault within the paradigms of patriarchal honor. So unless there is a shift in that, there is no way this law is going to work. And there is some sense in which we also seem to be reinventing the wheel. In 2009-2010, there was a huge effort by women's groups all over the country to put out a draft of a, a law on sexual assault that would address it in all its complexity, that named aggravated sexual assault, where sexual assault took place against women belonging to Dalit communities or women belonging to uh, uh, areas of military occupation or women belonging to minority communities in case of mass sexual assault. So it was an extremely comprehensive draft. But the minute this entire incident happened, what we had was the Verma Committee coming in, where the entire exercise that had already been done and that had been put in cold storage was reopened and one started from scratch all over again. And then we have the ordinance, which is a knee-jerk reaction, which is exactly the old law that is being brought in to supplant the draft that the Verma Committee suggests. So the Verma Committee says marital rape should be recognized within the definition of rape. The ordinance says no. So the, the ordinance, again, is, is a, it seems to be an immediate response of the government. But what, what has actually happened is that the government has slapped this ordinance on top of a draft that would actually be an advance on what we already have. So it is already a step back. So law clearly, I mean, when we, when we talk about change, in, uh, when we talk about law as the answer, I think really what we need to ask is, what law? What must be the shape and character of this law? And how are we then going to work it? And who is going to work it? Do we believe in the elements that we are putting into the law?
I'd like to um, <clears throat> sort of magnify what Kalpana is saying in a different way because I've been noticing and it's, it obviously impacts this very issue. But generally, if you look at what's happening in this country today, if somebody posts a, a post on Facebook, which is totally constitutional, instead of the state protecting that person's right to keep posting those same constitutional posts and arresting the ones who try and demonize or threaten her or him, they're arresting the, the person who's post, who, who posts on Facebook. A film gets a CBFC rating and it is passed and when it is disputed by a state, instead of the machinery saying, we will do everything in our power to make sure this film releases because it has been passed, the reverse happens. When you have December 16th, instead of the police saying, we will do everything in our power to ensure the safety, the security and the privacy of couples who go out at night, you tend, you want to prosecute them. We understand that nations and nation states are not interested in good governance, they're interested in law and order. As long as there's law and order, that's fine. It cannot be that way. That can be their interest. It is not our interest. So, the, the, it be, so Kalpana, just coming back to this, you, we have to fight it there and say this entire culture of victimizing the victim is unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable across the board because it's happening across the board. The other thing I wanted to say was, while I made the point that we have to educate our men, Kalpana wittingly or unwittingly also made the point that we have to educate our women. I'll give you an example. A policewoman taking a complaint of beating. This woman comes in from a slum and she's been beaten pretty obviously. And the policewoman says, what's happened? She says, I've been beaten. What did you do? She said, what did I do? Said, what? You must have done something to be beaten. And this happens everywhere. So whatever law you might write, the context and wh when you're sitting there in that police station, it means nothing. So I think the whole idea of even educating girls, whether it's the fair skin debate, whether it's that horrifying statistic when a lot of uh, women were asked, they said it's okay for husbands to beat us once in a while. And it, was a, it wasn't a very large percentage, but it was a percentage all the same. So I think while we're talking about this, I mean, everybody's swimming in a pool of patriarchy here. So we can't expect every woman to automatically be this gender sensitive warrior uh, uh, from, from the word go. And I, I just wanted to make, uh, sort of make another point is that the more I think about it, if we, if we don't become, not the vigilantes, if we don't become the carers, it's not going to happen. You can't have 50,000 policemen, police persons, looking after the interests of 19 million people in Bombay. You're going to have to build a community of carers. We're going to have to, we have to come out with a thought which is from the root up, which says wherever I am, Whichever public space I am in, I will look at one person silently and decide that if anything happens to that person, I will be there. And it's not just by, you don't have to hand a, pick up a weapon or, you know, brandish the constitution, nothing. It's just a question of saying that it, it more, more often than not, that's the deterrent. That's the deterrent. Well, what are you doing? Why are you harassing? Gone. But if that doesn't happen, I, I really, really don't believe that we should be looking at 50,000 police persons or how many ever, or the constitution or the laws to do this. Because that ultimately is going to tie this, maybe I'm being simplistic, but I think that's one of the things that can, that can tie this together in the long run. Yeah, I think it does keep coming back to the home, but I just wanted to make two short points about the legal side of things. One development that was very worrying in the light of not just uh, this particular rape but uh, in the light of previous uh, occasions has been the tendency to use a case like this to milk people's emotion and get something like the death penalty through or to ask for harsher, more punitive sentences without looking at this entire process and where the damage in the process lies. You know, if you have a situation where 
you make it harder for people to report rape because they have a 12-hour wait at a police station that's not in one of the metros, or where uh, you don't have a rape counselor, you don't have crisis centers, then that is actually something that we can do something about. And I was very disturbed at the levels of bloodthirstiness again, the sense that hanging somebody is going to solve this major problem. And again, on the back of talking about the rights of the survivors, you also have a duty to talk about the rights of the perpetrators, as difficult as that may be. Among something that Rahul said about the five rapists, one of them, the driver Mohan Singh, apparently went on record with the police. He broke down later and he said, yes, we had planned it. I was drunk. I didn't realize it was going to get this violent. I wish we had never done it. Everything that we did was wrong. And he's probably going to end up hanged anyway, but where does that retribution fit in with his remorse then? I'm not arguing for knee-jerk compassion, but I'm saying that there has to be a way to listen to these as well, to listen to the voices that say, we really are sorry, we didn't realize. Second part of it was again to do with the laws. Um, there has to be a way for people to actually listen to the voices of women's organizations who seem to be edited out of this conversation almost every time there's a major legal change. The laws that go through, the laws that the government uh, upheld in the sexual ordinance bill, are frankly the laws that protect women as somebody's property, you know, as either the property of their husbands or the property of their families, or as um, some kind of economic walking <laughs> good on two legs. But it has to move from that to protecting a woman's right to bodily integrity. And by extension, you know, to protecting men's rights to not have to go into this huge violent space, to not have to be perpetrators as well. Yeah, I think the voices that I heard from the young women who went out was the demand for equality. I think this is the thing. I think a lot of the talk has been how do we protect women, how do we make sure they're safe, and however good that might be, it doesn't, it's condescending. It does not acknowledge that you will only have a just society if men and women, if men truly believe that women are equal, if society truly acknowledges that men and women are equal. And I think that is really the bottom line that we have to strive for. Otherwise, as effective, even if we make our criminal justice system better, even if we make our police more sensitive, as long as there's this kind of belief that somehow this lot of people have to be, you know, either specially treated. I notice in some of the even more progressive ads that are now coming out as a result of this, there's still this thing about how do I just protect women, you know? This protect comes through all the time. Anyway, there's lots more that can be said, but I'd like to now open it up uh, to all of you. Uh, so I think we have, what, 10 minutes do we have? Um, so please um, ask a question, keep it brief so that we get lots of, oh, we have 20 minutes, okay, that's good. Um, and if you, if possible, address it to some, one of us, or if you just general question, we'll see who can take it up. Yeah. In the Indian films, violence by men is idealized. Many youth get uh, spoiled by this. Why not anyone do something to curb all these things? Because why that films show violence as a violent man as a big hero and can't. And then not the censor board, something about it. You did not touch that subject, so I want to know. Thank you. The Couple only film hero amongst us will answer this. <laughs> Who has suddenly become a film villain now. <laughs> um, okay, so here's, here's the dichotomy. On the one hand, I, don't be, I believe the effect cinema has on society is vastly overrated. An example of this is Los Angeles, which is the largest cinema producing city in the world, where every second film shows smoking. And yet Los Angeles, nobody smokes in Los Angeles. The largest incidence of smoking today is amongst poor Chinese farmers. They don't watch cinema. So, I really believe that this dangerous link between what people see versus what they will do is, is, it is entirely that. It is dangerous. However, that does not excuse misogyny in cinema. That does not for a second excuse any kind of um, uh, patriarchy or uh, misogyny in cinema. Therefore, I've, I've said so before and I'll say so again. I truly, as a filmmaker, just purely as a filmmaker, 
I don't see the need for an item song. It means that you're saying that your film is not gripping enough, that you've decided to put, you know, somebody with uh, uh, somebody who's going to be trying to titillate you out there for no reason at all. It doesn't belong in the story at all. So I have personal problems, creative problems. I believe this is it's it's a loss. It's it's an admission of defeat by a filmmaker. But I'm going to go past that. There is no space for misogyny if that is the ultimate message. But to show what should be, if it means that you have to show what shouldn't be, and I can't think of a more complicated example of this but Bandit Queen, where the last thing you come away from is a desire to rape. And yet, there is full frontal nudity and there's very, uh, not graphic, very suggestive, horrific, a very suggestive, horrific gang rape that takes place. If the takeout of all of that is a sense of humanism, I won't even say don't rape women as a message. A sense of humanism, well, that's, that triumphs over the fact that you showed full frontal nudity and you showed, you suggested a very brutal gang rape. So we have to look at this very, very carefully. It's a very, very dangerous debate to go into in a black and white way. We have to look at it as what the ultimate takeout from that creative product is. Hello. Hi, Rahul. Um, yeah. I have a question for both Rahul and Nilanjana. You spoke about forgiveness. And I get your point, but I find that troubling because a lot of these debates remind me of what happened when Khasab was given the death sentence where people speak about poverty causing terrorism. Now, people should know that rape is wrong without having to be arrested, without having to be confronted with all this and then looking back in regret. So, how do you deal with that? I mean, how can one possibly forgive rape? There are lots of people who grow up watching their mothers beaten, watching violence, but they don't go out and rape people. Not all of them become rapists. So, how, in that context, how can you uh, forgive rape? Yeah, sure. I think I'm coming at it from two completely different uh, needs. One is to the assigning of responsibility, which has to be done, you know. Whether you're talking about a father abusing his, beating his wife or abusing his daughters, or whether you're talking about a public gang rape of this nature, there is a responsibility, there is a decision that the rapist has made. And there's a decision to commit violence and to violate somebody else's rights um, that has to be acknowledged. But one of the things that has made me pause a little bit is that if you do a certain amount of prison visits, for example, uh, what you'll find is that by and large, rapists tend to fall into two categories. There's one kind who I find personally very hard to actually uh, c conduct conversations with, who eight years after the crime, eight years in prison, will still see nothing wrong with what they did. They see everything wrong with having been caught. But their point is still, she was asking for it. And at that point of time, the conversation you're hoping for breaks down. There is another situation though, and that happens more often than people realize, which is somebody finally confronted, usually not by the act of being caught, but usually often by something that happens later on down the line. A conversation with a lawyer, a conversation with somebody in the media, a conversation with counselors, or with fellow prisoners who comes to a point where he starts to change his mind. One of the saddest repeated cycles is that often this is coming out of a cycle of violence. There were eight disappeared years in the lives of Ram Singh, who was the young juvenile who was responsible for the worst part of the violence against that young girl. In those eight years, apparently he was brutalized by his own employers. He never knew what a healthy family was. I'm not arguing that he should not face the consequences of his actions, but too often our solution to things is to lock them up and throw away the key. We put somebody in prison, or we see that a sentence has been passed and our responsibility ends there. There's no attempt to see, will this person change? And there's a sense again of us and them that I always find very disturbing. You know, these criminals, they're not like us. This couldn't happen to our own families, even though it does. So, I guess all I'm trying to say in a complicated way is that you need to keep the space open to listen when somebody says, I do want to change. I don't want to do this again. I'm horrified by what I did. It may not happen very often that somebody comes into that space 
But when they do, are you going to receive them with more hostility, more anger, and in that sense perpetuate a cycle of violence against them? Or are you going to try, hard as it is, are you going to try to find a way out? There's another thing that I, I don't know how politically correct it is to say this, but the number of rape survivors who find, in order to get on with their lives, that they have to come up with forgiveness of the hard kind, which is not forgiveness in the sense of it's okay for you to have done this, but forgiveness in the sense of you did this, I think it was a terrible thing for you to do, but I am going to let go of my own anger and hatred so that it doesn't burn me up inside. So. Excuse me. Uh, uh, my question is to... Uh, hello. My question is to Rahul. Rahul, I'm on my um, on your left. My God, excuse me. I, I'm on an your atheist, left. but I thought suddenly there's God somewhere. Some, all right. I'm waiting. Never mind. <laughs> Who's this person? That's okay. Oh, there you are. Oh, thank God. All right. Okay. Um, in your opening sentences, you talked about. In your opening sentences, you talked about zero tolerance as well as giving a second chance. I found these two contradictory. So, what's your ultimate stand on that? Oh, it's very much what Nilanjana just said. Somebody right. must be responsible for their action. But that doesn't mean after they take responsibility for the action through a prison sentence or whatever it might be, right. that you cannot have it as a society in your heart to say, okay, now you have, if there is remorse and there's a genuine desire to change, we should be allowing them that freedom. So nobody's saying commute the sentence or let them go scot-free. Okay. So I think, in, and, and I appreciate your question because your question exemplifies what this country is going through. We believe it's black or it's white. It never is. No, because we have been brought up in a society listening, watching uh, or reading the stories of Mahabharata and Ramayana. A Draupadi wasn't raped, she was just touched, right? Or, or, or just looked at with a bad eye. Look what happened to the perpetrators in the Mahabharata as well as in Ramayana. Whereas in today's world, we are still thinking of remorse and giving them a second chance. That's my thought on I that. I have, a, I have a question. There please. are some other questions. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting. Okay, there's one there. Uh, and excuse, excuse me, I'm, wa I'm waiting since five minutes. Yeah? yeah. Uh, sir, all of you are discussing, but you forgot to say uh, when you read, 90% of the rapes happen because of alcohol. So there was a wonderful article. Alcohol. Alcohol. There was a wonderful article recently in, a, in some, some English magazines, Tamil magazines. You know, if you stop, I mean, if you close 90% of the wine shops, you know, you cannot completely stop rape or acid cases, but at least you can decrease. It cannot be stopped. It will happen even another 25 years. You know, but. If, 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 if all the men come ready to, not to drink or drink only 10, 20, once in 25 days, these kind of things will be because 95% of the cases are under alcohol and there should be death penalty because people are talking about chemical castration because we all men feel guilty that I rape. I also feel. Every man feels that is, their, their, their psych says, we, 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 we rape, that's why everybody say no, life in prison. Thank you, we got Thank the question. Let's Madam, just take one more question Madam, before we... I, yeah. I want to point out that Rahul, you mentioned uh, it's important to realize how we raise our sons, but we are yet to question how we raise our daughters. Why are we telling our daughters, don't wear that, you know, that, why are you going out without a dupatta? Please come home before dark. I have a daughter myself and I have to constantly stop myself from telling her, sit properly because, you know, it's... So I think it's equally important to have that conversation with your daughters as to the fact, and that is where equality begins, that you are treating your daughter to have as much access to the world as you are. So it's not a question, but I wanted to raise that point. Ma'am, does anybody want to question? Yeah, here sorry. is a question. Do you agree with the picturization of women in all medias? Films, advertisements, verses of uh, film songs, everything. So now there are three different aspects. One is that if there was no alcohol, there would be no rape. Another is how do we bring up our daughters also? And your third is uh, in a way linked to something that Rahul has already addressed, but the, the manner, which is the depiction of women. He is justifying the uh, no, no. worst things happening. The depiction of women in the media and what kind of impact does that have? So who would like to take up any of these three? 
Well, uh, the panel feels that I should deal with the alcohol question. <laughs> I, I can't ask why, but <laughs> I think that um, these are two very different and separate issues. Whether or not alcohol should flow is an issue on which we can have different opinions. Whether or not sexual assault can happen is a question on which there can only be one opinion. And I think that is the essential difference between the two. Um, there have been a lot of really eloquent things said since December. Do you want me to answer the media question? No. Okay. I mean, uh, just a sideline about the alcohol. I think it's very tempting always to look for an external cause, you know? And that might be a minor contributing cause to some aspects of violence against women. Uh, I don't agree with you that I'm afraid the studies don't seem to show it. I think it's much easier to say, shut down this, shut down that. And instead of looking inside and saying, why are homes so violent? Why do we stay in silence? Why do we maintain a silence about things like child abuse or about um, you know, ordinary, everyday, casual violence? Sometimes it's actual a husband beating a woman. That's the, uh, uh, that's the usual example. But there's also a violence of speech in families that uh, we need to address. I loved your point about needing to talk to our daughters because that debate has been going on in Delhi for a long time. The balance between needing to give your daughter information that might protect her and not wanting to curb somebody's sense of freedom and somebody's sense of owning their own bodies. Um, in terms of the media, the depiction of the media is again not something external to ourselves. Whether we are talking about a Honey Singh concert which became a huge issue some time back or whether we are talking about the number of advertisements that can see women only in terms of certain things, you know, uh, either they are sexual commodities or they are poor things who need to be rescued or they are housewives who are better than the finest vacuum cleaner you will get because they are always on, they don't even need to be battery recharged. You know, that, that is uh, magnificent. It's also equally condescending to men. Either you're a sensitive new age guy, in which case, you know, you're in a specific category and you're, you're the daddy with, you know, much love surrounding you or you're the soldier and the warrior who needs to protect. There's no shades of grey. So maybe the argument is not for less, you know, not for more policing. It's just for more complexity. And that, I think, when you look at some of the new Indian cinema coming in or when you look at what some of the new ads are trying to do, um, I like what I'm seeing. I think there is an attempt to shift away from what's just easily saleable. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just add there, you know, we did a study of uh, the coverage of women's issues in the media through the 80s and uh, for some of the younger journalists here, you wouldn't know what newspapers were like. But at that point, the third edit in every paper used to be a jokey kind of edit and always at the expense of women. It was taken for granted that it was perfectly all right to do that. Similarly, many of the cartoons that appeared always had some sort of what we would term sexist today, but it passed without any question. The fact that those things have gone has been because women's groups and others have campaigned, plus women journalists within these establishments have raised their voices and objected. So I think, you know, there is, let's acknowledge that there has been some change, though a lot more needs to change. Okay, I believe we have only two minutes left, so yours will be the last question. No, I'll... Uh... So as, pro, you know, I am an advocate and a mediator and I have been reading a lot about restorative justice and about victim offender mediation. And so this is a subject which, in which I am taking a lot of interest now. And I agree with Rahul that there's no point in saying this, these people have to be punished or this has to be done or something. There is a need for a lot of compassion, there is a need for a lot of understanding also. But then, how are we going to do this? See, Professor Amritya Sen says, there is a difference between Niti and Nyaya. And our own definition of Dharma itself makes it clear that justice itself is very relative. So are we going to say, yes, as, uh, as uh, Niranjana, Niranjana was saying, that just lock them up, is that enough? They also need a lot of attention. 
So, yes, we have to debate on all these things, but more than that, what are we going to do actively about getting it across to people to care for another person as an individual, as a person who has feelings, who has a right over their, his or her own body? Because it's not just sexual harassment of women. Today, there is a lot of child abuse. There is a lot of abuse in the family of both boys and girls. So there are a lot of issues that will have to take into consideration this aspect of care and connect and how they understand uh, them as individuals. So what are we going to do about it? That's my question. Thank you. That was more of a statement than a question. So I think we will not answer it. In any case, I've been told it's a wrap. Thank you very much for being an attentive and interested our audience. And thank you, panelists.